Welcome everybody to today's Lyceum Lecture. Um, the Lyceum Lecture Series is a community forum on the arts, science, spirituality, and justice made possible by First Parish in Bedford. Today we have a presentation. You can go on to the next slide, I'm sorry. Today we have a presentation with um, Bofa Malone, one of our uh, select women um, here in the town of Bedford, um, entitled My Refugee Journal, Journey, Journal. <laughs> um, and if you can go to the third slide, please. Um, we just wanted to remind people that the Lyceum presentations are recorded and then made available to everyone on YouTube. Um, this will be uploaded to YouTube in another day or so. If you have any concern and don't want um, your comments included in the YouTube recording, please call me uh, or email me at one of the locations listed on this slide. My number again is 781-752-7665. And you can just explain. Um, we want to respect everybody's privacy if they have any problem. Um, and I'd like to just introduce Bofa uh, before we continue. Um, Bofa is a VP and regional business advisor at Enterprise Bank. And she and her husband, Tom, and their two children, uh, Tavi and Kaylin, is that right, Bofa? Um, anyway, they moved to Bedford in 2016. And in 2020, she became the first Cambodian American woman elected to public office in Massachusetts as a member of our town select board. She's also the first person of color to serve on our select board here in Bedford. Bofa immigrated to the United States at age nine and credits caring mentors for helping her get to where she is today. As a first generation Cambodian American who benefited from the support and encouragement of others, her passion is to seek opportunities to give back to others facing similar challenges. In addition to her work at the bank, helping people create financial success for themselves and their families, she's actively involved with a number of nonprofit organizations. She's a trustee of Middlesex Community College, Lowell General Hospital, the International Institute of New, New England, and Communities for a Restorative Justice, C4RJ. She is also a member of, of Bedford's Rotary Club, and she's served as president of Women's Working Wonders Fund from 2018 to 2020, as well as the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association from 2013 to 2016. Finally, in 2018, Bofa was a candidate in the election for the United States House of Representatives here in Massachusetts Third District. And with that, we'd like to welcome Bofa Malone and um, you can take it away. Thanks very much to Paul Bradford for assisting us with this presentation. Great, thanks Ellen. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm just waiting for uh, my slides to come up. Do I uh, do I get to see the slides, Paul? Or yes, just uh, just starting now. Awesome. Thank and you. I hope I hope I didn't massacre your children's names. <laughs> no, you, no, you said it perfectly. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bopa Malone. Um, First, I want to thank First Parish Church for the good work that you do and for putting on this Lyceum. And um, not sure if actually my good friends, Rebecca Neal and her father, Ron Green, are on today, but I really appreciate them for um, recommending me to be a speaker. I'm honored to be here this afternoon virtually with you all to share a bit about myself and my refugee journey. Um, this is actually a picture of me when I was eight years old, the same age as my son Kaylin is now at the Refugee Processing Center in the Philippines. Um, Paul, you can go to the next slide. So as Ellen had mentioned, my wonderful husband Tom and I um, uh, moved to Bedford about five years ago with our two amazing children, Tavi and Kaylin. Tavi is 11 years old and Kaylin is eight. Um, 
there's so much to love about Bedford and this wonderful community, and we're just so fortunate and proud to be a part of it. Um, next slide, Paul. Professionally, I um, uh, work, I'm a vice president at Enterprise Bank. It's one of the top places to work here in Massachusetts. It's also one of the top places to work um, uh, nationally as well, actually, this year. And um, for those of you that haven't heard about Enterprise Bank, we're a community bank based in Lowell with um, 26 branches here in Massachusetts and in New Hampshire. Um, I'm, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been wonderful uh, helping families and individuals to create success through the bank. And uh, in addition to that, I'm also a community activist. Um, for over two decades, I've served on um, a, a bunch of nonprofit, uh, wonderful nonprofit boards as a board member and a trustee. And here in Bedford, as Ellen mentioned, I'm a Rotarian. I'm part of the chamber and I'm proud to serve as one of your select board members. I'm also proud that, uh, you know, I'm the first person of color to serve here in Bedford and the first um, Cambodian um, American woman to be elected here in Massachusetts and only the second to be elected nationally. Um, you know, I'm really blessed uh, to, uh, to be able to do what I love doing and, um, and uh, you know, to have this life that I have. But if you were to tell me um, when I was a little girl living in that refugee camp that I would one day come to the US and have this life, I wouldn't have believed it. Next slide. I like to take you back to Cambodia in 1975 before I was born. Um, this was when the Khmer Rouge invaded Cambodia. For those of you who um, uh, have not heard about the Khmer Rouge regime, they were a group of communist party who took over Cambodia from 1975 to 1979. And during their reign, they um, killed over 2 million of their own people, making it one of the largest genocides of the 20th century. Next slide. Because the Khmer Rouge placed a heavy uh, emphasis on the rural peasant population, anyone considered an intellectual or a political opponent was tortured and murdered. Um, other Cambodians were placed into work camps where the, the Khmer Rouge would starve them, made them work um, long hours with incredible demands. Um, for four years, my parents lived in fear with the trauma of uh, starvation, being overworked, and witnessing their family and friends um, being taken away to be murdered. This is one of the tactics that the Khmer Rouge regime used to question and torture people. Next slide. Anyone who didn't conform or if the Khmer Rouge thought that you're a risk or if they didn't believe that they were being truthful would be taken to these places. On your left, it's a picture of the S21 prison where the Khmer Rouge uh, converted a school in Phnom Penh to become a prison where they took um, prisoners and shackle them like what is shown in the picture and force them to live in tiny brick cells. Um, this place is all also uh, known as a Tol Slang and if you go to Cambodia today it's called the Tol Slang Museum. Just like the Nazis, the Khmer Rouge kept detailed records of all their prisoners. So if you visit Cambodia today you would see um, pictures of the prisoners and stories about them. Um, the picture on your right is of the killing fields. It's now called the Chung Aik a Genocidal uh, Center, which is a farming district right out of Phnom Penh. Um, after being detained in S21, thousands of men, women, children, and infants were brought to be murdered there. Um, this was where people were blindfolded and shot. Um, people were beaten to death to save uh, money on bullets and they would take babies and just um, hit them against trees until they died. Thankfully, like I mentioned, my parents went through the war camps and the Khmer Rouge believed them when they were questioned. Um, and, you know, they, they had 
to work incredible hours and, and they went through starvation, but they didn't have to go through uh, one of these places, but they did witness their family and friends being taken away and hasn't seen them. And most likely they went through one of these places. Um, next slide, Paul. My brother Soria was born in 1978, right before the Khmer Rouge regime ended in January 1979. And I was, I was born in 1980, um, which uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, had, uh, regime had already ended. And even though it already ended when I was born, the country was still in turmoil. My first memory was actually um, when I was three or four years old, um, when my mom took me on foot in the jungle from Cambodia to Thailand to escape Cambodia. Um, two, of my dis, uh, two of my distinct memories were um, the man who guided us kept on telling us not to step anywhere that he wasn't stepping on because he was afraid that we would step on landmines. And um, another memory that I had was I actually thought my mother was trying to kill me. Um, obviously she wasn't trying to kill me, but I just remember being very hungry and crying because I needed food, but my mom had her hand over my mouth and I couldn't breathe. Um, and like I said, obviously, obviously she wasn't trying to kill me, but she was trying to silence me so we wouldn't be caught by patrolling soldiers. After a few days, we were um, we reached Thailand, we were reunited with my father and my brother, and we were placed in a refugee camp there. Um, next slide, Paul. So even though Thailand was better, it was still not safe. At night, instead of hearing lullabies and reading books, we would go to bed hearing the sounds of gunfire and bombings. Um, most nights we would go we would go to bed listening to our parents escape plans as to which child they would take and where we would meet if we were to be separated. It became normal to us um, to run into a hole that we dug beneath the floor of, a, of our home um, to hide from the Thai soldiers when they came raiding each night. We lived like that for five to six years praying that we would have a chance to immigrate to America. Um, the first picture on the top in the background is what our house looked like and that on the bottom as well. Um, that's how we lived in Thailand um, for five or six years. Next slide. So our prayer was finally answered in 1989. The picture on the right um, is of my family and some family friends leaving Thailand um, to go to the Philippines. And on the left is uh, a picture of me and a bunch of refugee kids playing um, at the camp there. And in the background is what our house looked like in the Philippines. And we lived there for six months. Next slide. Finally, in, um, I think it was September, 1989, we, um, we came to America and we settled in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where we were one of the only two families uh, or Cambodian families living there. Um, I was nine years old. I was nine years old, starting second grade. I stuck out like a sore thumb. I didn't know any English except for yes and no. Um, luckily, I had uh, you know caring people who helped me overcome that. I had many teachers who stayed after school every day to help me with my English skills. They even came to my house um, and taught us what Thanksgiving and Christmas were like. Um, but it was really tough for my parents because they couldn't find a job to support us. So after a year in Pennsylvania, we resettled in Massachusetts. We lived in Lynn, which was a t uh, and in the tough neighborhood there. In Lynn, um, there was and still is actually a big Cambodian population. So my parents got connected with some of their friends and they had mentioned that if um, they moved there, they would help them find a job. So they did, we did actually. Um, next slide. So growing up, my parents uh, worked a lot. They were never home and 
my brother and I were often left alone all the time. Um, I adapted to the American culture and began to speak and understand less Khmer because my parents were really traditional. They were really strict, especially with me because I was a girl. Um, they wanted me to stay home, do housework, stay away from boys and study. Obviously, I know that what they were trying to do was out of love and wanting me to be su successful. But at that point, because I didn't understand them and due to the lack of communication, I often felt depressed, alone and intimidated. Luckily, when I got into high school, I learned about Girls Inc. And for those of you that might not know about Girls Inc, it's an organ organization that inspires girls to become strong, smart and bold. And because it was a safe place that I could go to after school and if and because it was for girls only, my parents allowed me to attend. Initially, I joined the teen program, just wanting to get out of the house. But the things that I learned there and the experiences that I received would change my life and help me to become the woman I am today. At Girls Inc., I had women mentors who understood my struggles and um, helped me to overcome my challenges and fears. They saw potential in me when I couldn't see it in myself. They took the time to listen and to encourage me to be brave. They showed me what it was like to be a successful woman and to empower me to help others. Um, and with their support, I gained confidence. I was happy and I no longer felt alone. Um, the picture on the left is of of, of me and a group of the um, friendly uh, persuader team um, at Girls Inc. And we actually did an ad to discourage people not uh, to uh, not to uh, discourage people not to smoke. Um, basically, it's uh, you know during a time where I was feeling alone, depressed, and could have turned into smoking, drinking, drugs, even gangs. Um, you know, I, I was happy that I was able to channel my energy in doing positive work and helping to educate others. Um, with the help of Girls Inc, I was able to apply to and receive a full scholarship to Leslie University. The second picture is um, with me and my father when I graduated Leslie. And um, during my sophomore year in college, I met Tom, who is my husband now. And, uh, you know, Tom often asked me about Cambodia and I knew nothing about it. And other people used to ask me about it as well. But when we came to the US, my parents never wanted to talk about what happened in Cambodia. So um, I didn't know anything about it. And we decided that um, during one of our winter break, we would take a vacation. So during my junior year, um, Tom and I went on vacation to Cambodia. And that vacation um, was an incredibly eye-opening, heart-wrenching um, experience I've had, and it made such a huge impact on me. Um, growing up in a tough neighborhood with really strict parents, I always felt like my life sucked. Um, my parents would always tell me how lucky I was but I really never, I, I didn't understand it. And when I got to Cambodia, what I saw um, people with no limbs lying on the street begging. I saw girls my age or even younger on the streets at bars at night doing things that they shouldn't be doing just to support themselves and their families. And for the first time I realized what my parents meant. Even, even though I didn't have what my friends had, I had the freedom and I had the opportunity to be in America, um, to be able to go to school and to have a voice. Um, this vacation changed my whole attitude toward my upbringing. I began to appreciate my Cambodian roots more and to reconnect with my culture and, uh, and language. Um, I was also inspired to give back and, and to do more. Um, and as a result, I 
graduated with a, um, a bachelor, not only with a bachelor's degree, but I uh, with a master's as well in business. And um, I decided to go to uh, to back to Cambodia to volunteer for a year. Um, the third picture is of me and Tom in front of Angkor Wat, uh, Angkor Wat Temple, um, which is Cambodian's uh, biggest tourist attraction and um, a proud symbol of Cambodian history. Next slide. So having just graduated from college, I did not have money to live in camp, uh, to live and volunteer in Cambodia. So I decided to write a grant proposal asking family, friends, um, Leslie College, local newspaper to help support my cause. Through that effort, I raised $10,000 from family, friends, strangers who um, saw how passionate I was about this project. In Cambodia, um, I learned about this dump site in Phnom Penh where children anywhere from five years old to 15 years old working all day um, from 5 a.m. in the morning to anywhere from to eight or nine that night with no proper attire just to earn 50 to 75 cents per day at the time. These children, um, they didn't know how to read or write in Khmer. So as a result, um, I decided that you know, we would help to open an informal school there where when they need a, a break, they can come in, have a snack, and we would teach them um, Cambodian language. So, and when they came in, actually, these kids, they were so talented. They, they came in, they were doing all these drawings, um, you know, and uh, they made purses. And then I just saw all these skills that they had um, so in addition to teaching them Khmer language, we ask them to make whatever they could make or draw whatever they could draw. And um, also what we decided to do was also teach them English language where they could actually go out to sell these things to expats um, for, the, for either two or three dollars per artwork or purses, purse. Um, so instead of making 50 cents to 75 cents a day, they could make four or like, uh, you know, six to 10 bucks a day. And at that time, $10 a day could feed their family for two weeks um, in Cambodia if you were a normal person there. Um, these pictures are of uh, Steng Min Chai, of um, what it looked like and how they lived in, you know, the home, their house in the background um, when I was there in 2003. Next slide. So, um, these are pictures of, uh, of my students and our classroom. Um, because many of the people who donated to me were strangers, every month I would send them an email with a report of what was going on, the challenges and accomplishments that I was facing and how I was using their money that month. Um, and in addition to helping with my living expenses, uh, you know, the donors didn't realize this at that point, they only thought it was just donating for my living expenses, but um, they were helping hundreds of Cambodian children with books, food, clothes, shoes, travel and hospital expenses. They also helped these kids to learn um, uh, their language and learn some English skill and, um, it, you know, and, and basically to help them earn more money to, to support themselves and their families. So these children, they, they work all, they had to work on all day on whatever little free time they had, they always, they never even, uh, you know, they were happy to, uh, to come to class and get an education because they wanted an education. And um, even though they didn't have a lot, uh, and, and they had to take on so much more than many adults um, uh, that I even know today, but uh, you know, they were happy. And this experience, I was so blessed to have had right after college because um, that experience and the, girl, the experience with Girls Inc. just helped me um, to be who I am today. 
even though um, I originally went to college studying business, I, I, my mentality was, you know, I want to study hard. I grew up poor, study hard, make money. And um, that was success for me. But that experience helped me to realize that I want to help others. Um, I, it was important for me to give back to help others the way others have helped me in my life. Next slide. When the year was over, I sent to all of my funders um, a, an annual report. And at the end of that report, I shared with them um, that I was looking for a job. So Carol Duncan, who was the executive director of Girls Inc. at the time, shared my story with her husband, George, who is the founder and chairman of Enterprise Bank. And I've been a member of the Enterprise family since. It's actually, um, my first and only real job. And um, actually last month, I just celebrated my 15th anniversary there. Um, Carol over the years have become a great mentor of mine and George has just, you know, he's always had a, an open door policy with me and all of his employees, empowering all of us to do whatever we need to do to help people, whether it's through banking or through community work. The second picture is, um, actually of uh, me helping one of uh, the biz uh, a Cambodian uh, business owner to, uh, to open his convenience store. And the third picture is of me and TV visiting um, one of my customers as a citizenship swearing in ceremony in Lowell, which I was really happy to do because um, I, I didn't get a, the experience to go through that. Um, in addition to helping uh, many people achieve success through the bank. Um, I've been involved, uh, I've been fortunate to be involved in the Lowell community, um, especially to be able to learn my language and my culture because Lowell has such a big population of Cambodians. Next slide. So I served as president of the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association. Um, uh, the organization is basically an organization that helps immigrants, uh, help Cambodians and other immigrants through social and economic program. And um, while I was president, a horrible fire happened where it killed seven people and displaced about 50 people, most of whom were Cambodians. And I was instrumental in helping um, raise over a quarter of a million dollars to help people get back on their feet. Second picture is um, I've been involved, I continue to stay involved with Girls Inc. by being on their board and mentoring other young girls. And um, the third picture, I was um, uh, proud to be a part of uh, a, the, a team representing Lowell to get a grant for over half a million dollars to help Lowell do some system work change in um, a disadvantaged neighborhood. Next slide. Because of um, can uh, I actually Paul? Can you go to ne the next slide instead? This is the other slide that I switched, uh, and then we'll go back to the top. Um, uh, because um, because of my involvement with the Lowell community, I um, I was able to join the city of Lowell as part of their delegation to go to Cambodia in 2015. Um, there for the first time since I was a little girl, I returned um, to the refugee camp on the Thai border where I spent uh, my child, part of my childhood. Um, it was a really emotional experience to, to go there and see and just seeing the poor conditions that we used to live in, remembering, um, you know, uh, the fear that we endure, just reminded me of how um, how fortunate we've been and how thankful I am for my parents' bravery and courage and the sacrifices that they made to help bring us here to give us freedom and a better life. Um, we actually got a chance to visit a hospital as well, um, the, Anchor, the Anchor Children Hospital. And just visiting there, um, 
as a mother just basically makes me, it made me sad. Um, you know, here in America, when my kids get sick, I call the doctor. I don't even think about it. I take them to the doctor. But there, um, because they don't have a lot of hospitals, there's only one or two in Phnom Penh, um, they would have to spend most of the day, if they had money, traveling to the hospital. And when they get to the hospital, they're not even guaranteed that they'll be seen. So they actually have to stay there outside of the hospital overnight and you know it just makes me sad because a lot of the children who whose condition could have been prevented if they were taken care of in time in a timely manner it didn't get taken care of and instead they end up living um with conditions for the rest of their lives and it's just um it's just sad um Paul, if you can go to the next slide, not up, not up, but down. Yep, thank you. These are the pictures um, of our delegation meeting with um, the Cambodian leaders, the prime minister, opposition leader, and the king. And then if you go back up now to the picture of Middlesex. Yep, next one, yeah. And so um, with all those experiences, I got, uh, and being an advocate for the community, I uh, was appointed as a trustee to Middlesex Community College um, as well. And um, there, you know, I was proud to help them obtain a one, I think 1.5 federal grant to help Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander student. Um, we actually built an Asian center there where uh, students doesn't have to be Asian any student can go in get some guidance and support from adults and pe their peers um, I also became a trustee of my alma mater Leslie University and uh, you know it's been it's just been so rewarding personally and professionally because um, to be able to advocate for students business owners, um, you know, this was full circle to me because um, coming here with nothing, basically to be able to do that for other people, it was just, you know, it made me so happy. Again, like I said, it was, uh, it was really full circle. Next, uh, if you could go down, <laughs> Paul, sorry, this slides got mixed up. Um, here? The next, yep. Mm -hmm. So that was all full circle for me and I, I was proud and felt everything was enough already. But in 2017, I had a heartbeat moment. For most of you, it's probably an aha moment. Um, one day during the fall, I read an article about Congresswoman Nikki Songus's retirement and how no candidate were running who reflected the city of Lowell's wonderfully diverse population. And for some reason, when I read that article, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. The more that I thought about it, the more my heart just kept on beating louder and louder and louder. And I knew that I had to throw my hat in the ring. Um, even though, as I mentioned, even though I was happy with what I was doing, I think along the way, I realized by being a trustee of the college and a trustee of the hospital, just hearing students uh, telling me, you know, they work multiple jobs in order to afford going to school. And when they go to school, they're hungry. And then they're afraid, they're afraid to be, because uh, they're DACA students. And, you know, how can you have or how can you study if you know if you you have to work so many hours you don't have proper sleep and you're hungry and you're afraid and hearing patient story of you know not having enough money or to uh, to to get care um and i think just hearing these stories made me realize that our country is going backward because when i came to the us 30 years ago these were the things that I was experiencing, but I thought 30 years later, it would have been different, but it hasn't. And it, it, 
instead it was going backwards for the worse. And growing up, my parents taught me, you know, you work hard, keep your head down, don't speak up or speak out. Um, don't even talk about politics because of what happened back in Cambodia. And even though I never thought of being a politician and I had no plans of ever getting into politics, I decided that instead of sitting on the sidelines, I wanted to do something about it. So I decided to run for Congress. Next slide, Paul. So in, obviously I did not win that race, um, but I'm very proud of the work that we brought to bring attention to um, hunger, homelessness, housing, uh, jobs, especially amongst communities of color and the disadvantaged. We registered new people to vote. We inspired young women like Tida who heard about my story, who um, her parents came to America the same way that I did, taught her the same thing, don't get involved in politics, and she wanted to. And um, because I was running, she shared my story with her parents. And now her parents is allowing her to do what she wants to do in life. And she's now actually studying political science and um, uh, will get into politics. Again, like I said, I didn't win that election, but victories like that were what mattered to me. And that was winning for me. Next slide. So through running, I learned so much through the experience um, about how government works and how the right politician could really make a big difference. Um, and instead of just going back to doing the usual things that I was doing, I looked for opportunities where I can bring that perspective. While running, one of the issues that I felt would be a threat to our democracy was the, gro the growing role of money in politics. So in 2018, the Massachusetts ballot two question got um, on commission on limiting election spending and corporate rights got passed. And I was appointed by Governor Baker to be one of the 15 people to research the current um, campaign finance system and make recommendations on an amendment to overturn Citizens United. Next slide. Um, as an activist in the greater Lowell region, I was immersed in immigration, healthcare, education, women and girls issues. Um, but when I ran for Congress, I heard from a broader group of people and I learned more about the critical issues such as climate change, um, the need to reform uh, our justice system, immigration, the opioid epidemic. So as a result, I got involved with these organizations to learn more about the issues and to help advance the work. Next slide. As I became engaged, um, more engaged in Bedford through the Rotary Club, Mothers Out Front and Communities for Restorative Justice, I learned today more than ever that we need um, diverse perspective at every level of government, especially local ones. Even though I was a newer resident to Bedford and living here for a short period of time, I saw the growth in our population and our changing demographics. I felt that to continue to become stronger together and to get to the ne next level, we need leader. Um, we need leadership that reflects the Bedford of today and of the future. So like, as I felt as when I ran for Congress, I believe that representation matters and so I decided to run for select board to bring a voice of younger families and diversity to the table so that decisions are made collectively and when the greatest possible input is considered. And through our grassroots campaign of going door to door, listening to each residence, um, I learned so much about the issues that are important to residents. And um, in last, in 2020, last March, I was honored to have been elected. Next slide. 
Um, as you all may know, I was elected the day before the governor's stay at home executive order due to the pandemic. As you can imagine, um, my experience so far has been a challenging and interesting one with the pandemic, with our country's struggles, with racism and the Capitol riot, just to name a few issues. And although these are national issues, I'm very proud that Bedford is addressing them locally as well. So for example, I'm happy that um, Bedford is part of an application for um, the REMAP, which is Racial Equity Municipal Action Plan Program uh, grant, I mean. Um, we're one of the only six communities that's actually uh, was picked for this to um, to, to get technical support and consultant help to advance racial equity work. So I'm really proud of that. Next slide. You know, I say this a lot, even though, even during this presentation of how blessed and lucky I am, because, you know, again, like I said, if, if you were to tell me when I was that little girl in those refugee camps um, that I would one day come to the US and have this life to be able to go to school, um, have a great education without a lot of debts that our students are facing, to be able to go back to Cambodia to help open an informal school for disadvantaged children, to build a career where I get to help thousands of families, businesses, individuals, um, give them financial literacy and to even have a chance to run for Congress and now to serve as your select board member, I, I really wouldn't have believed it. And I'm so blessed that my dreams um, have come true, but I know that this would not have been possible if it wasn't for the courage, the sacrifice, the bravery of my parents, especially my mother who I can't imagine taking me on foot from one country to the other to escape. Um, so on this Mother's Day month, I want to thank my mother. I want to thank all of the moms out there that's listening as well. A happy Mother's Day. And I want to thank First Parish Church for having me here to speak today and all of you for um, being here to listen to my story and learn a bit about me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bofa. It's so moving. Um, I have many questions, but we want to open this up to the group. And um, I wonder, Paul, if you can help me in terms of looking through the participants and so we can field questions um, from the audience. Sure. Can uh, people? Um raise their hands in, in Zoom. That would be the easiest way to using keep track of this. Using the participant option? Yeah, there's, okay. <clears throat> depending on the version of Zoom, it's either participants, there'll be a raise hand button, or you have a reactions menu that has a raise hand. Great, yeah. Well, I'd like to start it off first of all and um, ask, yeah, and well, thank you very much, Bofa, first of all. Um, I wonder if this whole, even telling your story is re-traumatizing. And so, you know, for that reason, I really want to thank you even more so sharing this with, with us. Um, but I was curious, first of all, why Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? when your family finally got here. Can you explain how that fit into the placement and your immigration? Yeah, yeah, so, um, so my uncle actually, um, before the war, immigrated and lived in Pennsylvania. And um, for some reason, my parents got connected with them and uh, we could have actually, we, we didn't need to stay in Thailand for five or six years if we, um, uh, if, uh, if we were going to Australia or France or whatever, but because of the fact that my parents um, knew that my uncle was, he was part of the Navy, immigrated, 
before the even the war even happened and because they were living there somehow they got connected and my parents wanted to immigrate to the US so we could be reunited with them and they took us in for the year and even though my uncle was like you know you don't need to work we can support you obviously my father wasn't like that it, it, it wasn't just him we came as a family and he he was a proud man he you know was working before the war happened and just not being able to find a job and supporting his family was not what he wanted to do. So that's why we came to Pennsylvania and left. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I actually had a question since no one else has raised their hand. Please. Um, when you went back to Cambodia and started teaching, um, had you retained enough of the language that, that you could do that or did you have to study it again? No, I did not. I had to study it again. And so that trip, I actually got a chance to study as well. Um, but when I was teaching, I was actually teaching English and I partnered with an organization there and they had Khmer teachers. So I got, uh, while I was teaching English, I was able to learn Khmer with the students as well. And how did you um, find out about this organization so that you could um, reach out and do some fundraising so for this volunteer yeah, concept? So, so basically, I, you, I couldn't have gone to Cambodia to visit the organization because that was expensive. I looked online, I saw an organization. First organization I saw, I connected with them right away. And um, when I went to Cambodia, uh, I actually partnered with one organization. And then when I got there, some of the things that I learned about the organization, I just wasn't aligned with. So for example, in Cambodia, it's a third world country. Every child needs an education, right? So it doesn't matter. You're teaching, you're teaching every student. But at that point, being right out of college, um, I wanted to teach the most vulnerable. I wanted to give free education to all kids that wanted it. But this organization actually owned, they took, uh, there was a fee to go to school and it was only like more of like the kids that had money to go and the kids that didn't and wanted to go, I couldn't teach them. So actually I left that organization because I knew that I only had a year and I wanted to make a big difference and I wanted to spend time with the most vulnerable. So I, I uh, you know, it was just in some way traveling one day, saw this dump site, was like, oh, what is this place? Let me go explore it. Want to explore it just was like, <laughs> You know, I don't know if you've seen Slumdog Millionaire. It's basically the same thing of like, oh my gosh, like, how are you living like this? And what, and what are you doing? And then there was no school there. And so then I, I basically, because I was living there anyways, I found another organization and shared with them about this site because they didn't, they weren't doing anything there. So I said, there's a site that we need to go to that we actually need to build a school partner with them and and teach these kids so that's how we got there we partner with that organization wonderful i see um, a couple uh, of other hands so um, Paul, yeah huh? corinne had a hand raised uh, do you still have a question corinne um well i was just well first i want to say just such an incredibly moving story i mean the, the feelings that welled up just hearing your story were incredible. Uh, I was just wondering what brought you from Harrisburg to Massachusetts? Yeah, so, um, so Lynn and Lowell has a big popula population of Cambodians. So Lowell has the second biggest population um, besides Long Beach, California and Lynn actually also. So my parents somehow got connected to some of their friends that were living in Lynn at the time. And they said, uh, you know, if you come to Massachusetts, we could help you find a job, which they did. And it was one of those, you know, a lot of under the table busing 
um, a bunch of workers to a certain place working different hours and they they were willing to do anything just to be able to make it and support us and that's what they did. Uh, Ron has his hand raised. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, unmute, please. There we go. Both oh, hi, I'm a, a Rebecca Green Neal's dad. Hi, Ron. Yeah, and we met when yeah. you were first campaigning. And I said, well, here, there's a nice woman. She's very, very, very nice, very smart. Uh, but she's running in a town that she really hasn't lived in very long and she's running against an incumbent and and i said she doesn't have a prayer but then i started listening to what you had to say and i saw your energy and for me your energy is boundless there is no limit to your energy uh and your your presentation today certainly confirmed that uh, i'm delighted that a you decided to move to Bedford. B, you were in for selectmen. C, you topped all of all the vote getters. I think that's a remarkable accomplishment for you, and uh, I can't to see. I can't wait to see what your next chapter is. Thanks, Ron. And you know, I'm really blessed. The Bedford community has been really open and uh, welcoming to me and my family. We absolutely love it here, and. I'm, you know, I'm very thankful to many people that uh, even though they didn't know me, they gave me a chance and thank you for allowing me to serve you. Um, I, can't, I can't guarantee that I'm, you know, I'm always gonna solve everything. But one thing that I can guarantee you that I know for sure is that I'm a hard worker and, you know, I'm, I love making a difference and I love serving, so. I'm honored to serve you. Uh, we have uh, Karen Frederick. Karen, you'll need to unmute yourself. Hi, it's really inspiring to hear your story, Bofa. And I'm I'm thinking, uh, I'm wondering uh, with the uh, experience you've had, you've seen things back home in Cambodia, you've uh, learned so much about um, the community here in our surrounding area, and we live in a time of such issues still. I wonder uh, if you could give us some ideas of how the rest of us can support uh, your um, visions. Um, we could say at an individual level, but I'm going to take the community level. How can we be supportive of uh, improving the story of people's lives here? Uh, let's start with, with Bedford. Do you have any insights for us? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I think uh, we're what I learned about Bedford in, in coming here, like, uh, you know, uh, in our school system, we have, uh, like, there's 52 languages that are spoken in our, our school system. And I think, um, you know, I, I think that's wonderful. And I think uh, each of us, uh, like, you know, we, we come with different experience, we come with different background. And I think it's, um, it, you know, I think it's, it's important for for all of us to be able to listen and learn from one another. And I think one of the things that um, you know, I like I said initially, I think you know personally for me, I, I feel like Bedford is just such a welcoming and open community to me and my family. And I would love to see that um, continue and being open, uh, like you know, even working with this racial equity plan. Um, being able to um, expand our community that we love so much for others as well, um, uh, to, to have them benefit as well. Because for me, um, and I know sometimes when you talk like that, it's, it, it, it's kind of scary because you know you, you have 
um, others that want uh, that you hear that wants to keep our community, the small town community, or or. Um, but at the same time, I think um, you know, for me, it's like, how do we continue? Like, I would love to continue to, um, you know, share the different background culture, but also how do we um, uh, personally? I've always been so blessed that, uh, you know, I, people are so welcome to me. I get to live in this great community, but how can I help to advance that and, and expand that for others so that they can have that chance as well with, uh, that they could live in a community that I could live in and benefit from all of these resources that I've been able to benefit from. And I know that I've been lucky, but I know that how do I help to create those opportunities for others to be lucky as well, like I have, and um, you know, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, it's uh, it's a lot of um, uh, you know, it's a lot of hard work. But I but I feel like those are the things that I, I feel like I I would love to do because um, I know for sure that if it wasn't for people who took the time to listen to our story and helped us acclimate, help us, um, you know, get have chances, I, I wouldn't be where I am today. And for me, my dream is to be able to do that for other people and give them those chances that I've had. So how we can help create the, the opportunities for people. Mm -hmm. and even more. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, we have Meg Lashak. Hi, am I unmuted? Yes. Good. Uh, Bobo, first of all, I want to say thank you for sharing your story, which is so extensive, and for sharing it so deeply. Um, I think all of us have, are just, um, you could have a, a mental picture of me sitting here with my mouth open, be, just because everything was so amazing and so challenging and uh, bless your heart and your energy. Aren't we lucky to have you here? My question for you is, um, I wondered whether as you matured as a young woman and spoke with, spoke with your parents about understanding better how they raised you and why they raised you that way, did they seem were they able to take that in? Did it give them a sense of release and a sense of pride and gratitude that you understood? Yeah, of course, yes. And, uh, you know, to, yeah. And, uh, and for, me, for me personally, you know, I, I feel as a mother now, as a parent now, knowing even though my kids aren't even going through the same things that I went through, I feel like I'm so protective of them. And I can't imagine, you know, my parents who risk everything to give us just a better life and opportunity and to come to the US. But, you know, when we live in the US, even again, even though it was better, we were living in a tough neighborhood. It was in Lynn. It was like infested with gangs and teen pregnancy at the time. And I just rem like, it, you know, it's um, and that's all they wanted to get me out of. They didn't want me to be pregnant at an age where I shouldn't be pregnant. I should be focusing on school and they didn't want me to be in a gang. And that was absolutely what I sh I'm proud not to be like not to, um, to have had, uh, uh, you know, to not have to go through that. But, uh, you know, I just feel like uh, now looking back, I, I feel guilty and uh, to even give the, giving them a hard time about, you know, how, how my life stinks and everything and, and making them feel that way where, you know, if I can't imagine the trauma that, you know, they, they had to live through and, and they had to conceal to, to raise us. Um, so I just, and yeah, I'm just, I feel really guilty. And I'm, uh, but you know, I'm, um, well, we, we've talked about it and, and they are proud and. I'm well, I bet they, I bet they've forgiven you. And so you should forgive yourself. And I think that uh, not even just within 
uh, the Lyceum community, but in the uh, thinking of other people who maybe don't attend our Lyceums, I think within this town, we could come up with some really good ideas for uh, some get togethers for people from different cultures. I think we should all do some brainstorming separately and then find a way to do some brainstorming together and make a couple of those things happen. I think it would be great for everybody. So I appreciate your push on that. Thank you. Um, so we have one more question. I think this will be the last one from Diana or Judy. Uh, you could unmute yourself. Opa, thank you so much for telling us your story today. I wanted to thank you publicly in at First Parish for what you have done in terms of helping Maria's children. Um, probably many of you don't know that, well, Bob and I had met through Communities for Restorative Justice we on a fundraising committee together. And Bopa told me that she really, you know, enjoyed helping people and she was from Lynn. And so we started talking about um, help for Maria's boys and she was extremely helpful. She came and met with Maria and Anthony and Saul and her, she and her brother were instrumental in getting Anthony his first job and giving the boys um, a role model that, that they could see that they could have opportunities too. And uh, I just wanna thank you publicly and the boys were planning to be here today to be online, um, but uncle had a barbecue. So I'm sorry, but you got thrown over for a barbecue. <laughs> but well, thank you so much. Thank you for introducing me to them and for allowing me, you know, giving me a chance to help them. As I mentioned, I share this with you a lot, Diana, when we talk, it's like, you know, when we first came to the US, those were the things that we experienced and to have that chance to be able to give back to Maria, Anthony and Saul, it's, um, it's just, you know, I think it's a blessing for us to, to to be able to give back in that way. So I, uh, you know, it, uh, thank you for, for that opportunity to, to help them. And thank you for all that you do for them as well. Thank you so much, Bopa. It's, I'm privileged to know you. Thank you very much, Bofa. And um, it, there's a lot of interest, obviously, in your presentation and following up on that. Um, would you be willing to share your email address? Of course, of course. Do you want to do that verbally now, or do you want me to send it out later? Um, so my email is basically just my first name, Bopa, B-O-P-H-A dot Malone, M-A-L-O-N-E at gmail.com. My number is 781-913-4976. It's a cell phone number, so please feel free to text or call. Um, but yeah, uh, if you like to connect, have questions, or if there's anything that I could do to help, please don't hesitate. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. And I just want to close by letting people know that this is actually the last Lyceum of the uh, church year, which ends the end of June. For obvious reasons, our church is going through a lot of changes, but the Lyceum will return in September. Um, we're also keen to hear your suggestions for topics and or presenters. Um, and you can reach me at my email address, which I gave earlier. It's still on the screen. Um, and Paul, the next uh, slide and final slide, please. We just wanted to thank Paul um, for being our Zoom tech today and Bob Bat and the rest of our technical teams for their continued assistance. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye now. <laughs>